and welcome back to the Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and as always, I'm glad you decided to spend some of your time today listening to me talk about military history. Today, we're going to continue with our survey of the career of the Schmidt BF-110 heavy fighter in the Second World War. We'll pick it up after the initial campaign in Poland and examine the performance of these men and machines of the Zerstorer arm as they embark on one of the most important phases of their wartime career, the decisive campaigns fought in Western Europe during 1940. My source for this one will be, once again, the excellent BF-110 Zerstorer Aces of World War II by John Wheel. So now, if you're ready, let's go ahead and turn our attention to the tense Europe of the late fall of 1939. After the fall of Poland and the general mobilization of the European powers for war, a period of comparative inactivity followed would last from late fall 1939 until April of 1940. The Western powers, forced into a war they had tried hard to avoid and were not fully prepared for, seemed unable or unwilling to strike the next blow. The Germans were still fighting alone in Europe at this time, and had left only weak forces in the West to resist a possible move by the Allies. Luckily for Hitler and his regime, they appeared to have successfully bluffed and intimidated their opponents into not taking advantage of this opportunity. Thus, they were granted the time here to liquidate the massive commitment of German forces to the East and redeploy them against their new and much more powerful enemies, while also unexpectedly being allowed an opportunity to rest and re-equip their depleted forces. They were also able to use this vital pause to bring newly mobilized forces and several months' worth of production of munitions to bear. The French did mount an offensive along the southern part of their border with the Reich, but this was an abortive affair and did not develop any momentum. The French units involved withdrew after a short advance into German territory. At sea, there was considerably more activity. The U-boat force had been set loose on Allied shipping, and though the submarines were relatively few in number at this time, they took a heavy toll from virtually the first day. Submarine arms' main effort was against the merchant shipping on which Britain depended, and in this they were assisted by a small force of surface commerce raiders, both regular naval cruisers and converted disguised merchant ships. They were a serious threat to the battle fleet as well. Major successes by the submariners in late 1939 included the sinking of the aircraft carrier Courageous on September 17th by the U-29, and the October 14th penetration of the Royal Navy fleet base at Scapa Flow by the U-47, which sank the battleship Royal Oak in the harbor. In both of these cases, the submarine was able to escape unharmed. On the other side of the balance, the pocket battleship Grafsch Bay was lost in South American waters. Much of the fighting in the air that took place in this relatively uneventful period was related to the war at sea. Given the somewhat alarming naval situation, Bomber Command decided to test out its strategic bombing doctrine with a program of raids on German warships and naval targets. Attempts in the first months of the war to locate ships with reconnaissance aircraft and then send bombers to attack had proved costly and fruitless. Attempts were then made to send out bombers to patrol on so-called armed reconnaissance sweeps over the North Sea. Such missions were met by German fighters. Though the 110 was not intended as an interceptor, its long range made it desirable in this defensive role, since what was wanted was a fighter with the range to meet the bombers out at sea and, if needed, to chase them back after their attacks. Some of the Zerstorer groups that were still flying the single-engine 109s as the year came to a close had been dragooned into an ad hoc air defense command set up along the seaboard to meet the bomber command attacks. When these converted to the new twin-engine fighter, they were retained in this strategic defensive role and proved quite valuable. How useful they were can be illustrated by their involvement in combating one of the largest of these so-called armed reconnaissance sorties. On December 18th of 1939, a force of 24 RAF Wellington twin-engine bombers were sent on a mission to the German fleet base at Wilhelmshaven to detect shipping in the harbor there. They were intercepted by Luftwaffe fighters including 110s from ZG-76 and ZG-26. Single-engine fighters were the first in to attack, but as they ran out of fuel and disengaged, the 110s took over and harassed the English bombers as they fled homewards, chasing them well out to sea. Along with the units of BF-109s, as their stores disrupted the attack and shot down fully half of the force, the majority of the kills being scored by 110s. Two 110s were badly damaged in the battle, and three 109s were shot down. Only a few of the Wellingtons managed to drop their payloads on the shipping in the harbor, with no effect. This relatively minor action was given the title Battle of the German Bight or the Battle of the Heligoland Bight, and it marks the end of RAF daylight strategic bombing operations. The huge proportions of losses suffered by the Wellingtons in this attack convinced RAF Bomber Command to abandon daylight operations in all but exceptional cases. These and similar actions against the English raiders would make up the bulk of the little combat the Wilmano units would see in these uneasy months. Little air activity took place across the German-French front, and what there was was centered around reconnaissance flights and attempts to intercept them, and 110s were rarely involved in these battles. This protracted lull was broken in April 1940 when the Germans launched Operation Weser Ubung, 
The attack on Denmark and Norway. Well, no units would play a prominent role in this attack. Long distances involved, as well as the nature of the fighting itself and the opposition in the Norwegian phase of the campaign, made demands that the 110 was the best available aircraft to meet. Despite this, relatively few of those available were committed to the assault. The first group of ZG-26 and the first group of ZG-76, both veterans of the Polish fighting, were earmarked for this plan. These six squadrons brought about 60 or 70 BF 110Cs to the battle. Unfortunately for the Norwegians, the German attack caught them with very few aircraft in their service which could match those brought against them. In the fighter category, the Norwegians were best served, but even here they possessed only 12 gladiator biplane fighters and four Armstrong Whitworth scimitars. The Norwegians had intended to produce this latter plane under license at their facility in the town of Keller, this never came off. Both fighters are broadly similar biplanes, with top speeds in the 250 miles per hour or 400 kph range, and a pair of 303 caliber machine guns. These 16 outmoded fighters were all that Norway had to oppose the Germans in the air. 55 Curtis Hawk 75 fighters, modern though unremarkable American aircraft, had been ordered before the war, but of these only 19 would arrive before the conflict began, and these would still be in crates or otherwise not ready for action when the invasion came. The remainder were still in ships on the high seas at the time of the attack, and were diverted to Allied ports. The only other modern aircraft in the Norwegian inventory were, ironically, supplied by the Axis powers themselves. They're both twin-engine reconnaissance types. Four Italian Caproni CA-310 served with the Army, and six Heinkel HE-115A floatplanes flew for the Navy. The Norwegians had no modern bombers at all, the only machines in this category being small, slow, 1920s vintage Fokker CV series single-engine biplanes. The Naval Air Service operated another 40 or 50 aircraft, all of them obsolescent patrol seaplanes, almost exclusively older biplane types. The only exception was a single modern German Arado AR-196 floatplane, which had been catapulted off the German cruiser Admiral Hipper. This scout plane had been turned by the Norwegians in the period immediately preceding the outbreak of hostilities, after having made an emergency landing in their territory. As for the Danes, they had a small number of Fokker D-21s, modern monoplane fighters with radial engines, similar to the Curtis Hawk 75. Like the Hawks, the Fokker fighters were comparable in performance to the aircraft the Germans would be using, although as fighters they were not really a match for the latest models of the Mischerschmitts. This was mostly a moot point, however, as few of these fighters would actually make it into the air to oppose the German onslaught. The bulk of the fighter opposition the Germans would actually face in the air would be British, both fleet air arm carrier planes and RAF fighter aircraft. Short-range RAF fighters were transported to Norway by sea, flown off of Royal Navy carrier decks to Norwegian airfields. The RAF would bring gladiator biplanes at first, with hurricanes somewhat later, while the Navy would fly sea gladiators and skuas. The British gladiators were the same biplanes as those used by the Norwegians, and they were built by the Gloucester Company. The sea gladiator was a navalized version, equipped with arrestor hooks and carrier landing gear. Hurricane was the first high-performance British monoplane fighter, and would go on to be an RAF mainstay throughout most of the war. The earlier marks of the fighter encountered here and in the campaigns in the later part of this year were a tough opponent for the Germans. The 109 usually had the advantage. The 110, however, was generally at a slight disadvantage against the early hurricane, but this was not a decisive advantage, and a well-piloted Zare store could handle the British plane. The Blackburn Skua was a single-engine, two-seat naval aircraft intended for use in the fighter and the dive bomber role. It was flown from aircraft carriers as well as land bases. Though the plane was, like the improved ferry Fulmar after it, a modern monoplane design, it was handicapped in its performance by the presence of the second crewman. Fleet Air Arm Doctrine stipulated two men aircraft as fleet fighters, as it was thought that such a naval fighter would need a navigator slash radio man to carry out interceptions over the sea. Also, it was imagined that the major threat that naval fighters would counter would be bomber and reconnaissance aircraft, so mediocre performance was not that much of a handicap as it would have been against high-performance fighters. This showed in the SKUA's thoroughly pedestrian top speed of only 225 miles per hour, about 360 kph. This and its lackluster maneuverability made it a poor match for the German fighters in air-to-air -air combat, but as a dive bomber it enjoyed some success. Early in the Norwegian campaign on April 10th, for example, skuas from two squadrons based in the Orkneys sank the German cruiser Königsberg as it lay in Bergen Harbor. The attack on Denmark could really only be one thing, walkover, and that's what it was. The 110s of the first group of ZG-1 and the first group of ZG-76 were detailed to support the seizure by paratroops of two important airfields at the beginning of the invasion. The only notable action was the strafing of the airfield at Verilos, Copenhagen, 
where the Womanos destroyed 14 Fokker and light bomber aircraft parked on the field, as well as one D-21 that attempted to take off and engage the attackers. Fighting was soon over, and the Womanos of ZG-1 took up their new station at Alborg, where they would now remain and fly defensive missions against the persistent RAF bomber incursions. On their own initiative, officers of this group organized an early night fighting unit, titled by them the, quote, Dusk Readiness Fleet. This group took advantage of the fate brightness that remained in the night sky at these higher latitudes, and patrolled over the sea, looking for British intruders silhouetted against this faint glow. These attempts were without success, however, and were soon abandoned as this unit was transferred back to Germany. The other Air Store group involved in the invasion, the first group was EG-76, participated in the opening attack on Denmark, and then went on to their main mission, escorting and supporting the assault by airborne troops in the critical Norwegian airfields of Stavanger and Oslo Fornebu. These attacks were crucial, parts of the overall plan for the invasion and rapid conquest of Norway. The plan was that these airborne attacks on the major airfields would be combined with a series of naval landings in important seaboard towns. These blows, descending unexpectedly in quick succession, would have a paralyzing effect and disrupt the resistance of the Norwegians. The part the 110 squadrons were intended to play was crucial to the success of the airborne part of this strategy. The plan was that the Womanos would go in ahead of the transports and suppress the airfield's defenses by engaging any fighters and carrying out strafing attacks on the defending flak positions. The first wave of transports would drop parachutists, who, with the close support of the heavy fighters, would overcome the initial resistance to the Norwegian actually present on the field. The Womanos would then land, along with the second wave of transports who would bring loads of combat-ready airborne soldiers to back up the parachute troops, consolidate their hold on the airfield, and resist a probable counterattack by stronger Norwegian forces. The captured airfield would then act as one end of an air bridge over which more troops and equipment would be sent. Once this was secure, the Germans holding the field would go over to the offensive. This plan was bold, to be sure, and full of risk, and very dependent on the successful coordination of the units involved. A squadron becoming lost or one arriving out of sequence could cause fatal confusion and lead to disaster. However, the unconventionality of the plan could also work in the Germans' favor, as the Norwegians at the target airfields would hardly expect it, and they would likely be caught unprepared. The attack went in later that day, with a squadron each assigned to cover the attacks on the Norwegian fields. The second group of ZG-76, over the Skygarak, ran into thick fog. The squadron leader became lost and ordered his unit back to base, but only part of the squadron heard him. Four 110s pushed on in the Merc, and two of these collided in midair. The remaining pair found their way to Stavanger in time to provide what support they could to the paratroops that arrived shortly afterwards then put down on the newly secured landing strip with nearly dry tanks. The other squadron, the third of ZG-76, had an even more hectic time. The fog had also stymied their chances, and they were ordered to return to their base. However, of the three formations involved in the attack, only the transports carrying the paratroops actually turned back. The 110s and the transports full of troops ready to be landed in captured airfield pressed on separately. Arriving at Oslo Fjord, the Womanos entered clear air and were immediately attacked by a patrol of seven Norwegian gladiators. Each side lost two planes in the ensuing skirmish. Five planes were driven off. The Womanos arrived at the target airfield with fuel enough for 20 minutes flight remaining. Most of this time was used up by the time the assault transports arrived and began to form a landing pattern on the uncaptured airfield. The first came in to land and drew heavy fire from the unsuppressed and likely incredulous Norwegian defenses. Chaos broke out in the air around the field as everyone realized at once that the plan had fallen apart the 110s came on and made firing passes at the flak positions, but they had been in the air too long and their tanks were nearly dry. The squadron leader ordered his fighters to land. While the rest of the squadron did their best to keep the defenders' heads down, the first 110, engine smoking from the damage in the combat with the gladiators, brought his plane down hard on the enemy runway. The pilot was unable to stop his aircraft and ran off the field, but he and his backseater survived. The remaining 110s braved the shocked defenders and followed suit, as did more and more Ju-52 transports. As the airborne soldiers spilled out of the transports and tackled the Norwegian defenders, the 110 crews maneuvered their still mobile fighters into firing positions on the ground and supported the infantry with their rear cockpit machine guns. Shortly after this, the defenders withdrew. This desperate action was instrumental to the establishment of the Germans' hold on southern Norway and the central portion of the country. Very quickly, within hours, resistance in this part of the country all but collapsed. Two days later, the squadrons that had participated in the assault were concentrated at their new base at Stavanger, where they were joined by the 3rd Squadron, bringing the group up to its full strength. For the rest of the month, they flew escort missions and patrolled the coastal seas, looking for British intruders, in the course of which missions they took a respectable toll of British bombers and patrol aircraft, mainly Wellingtons, 
Blenheims, and Hudsons. Allied resistance proved futile, and by the end of the month, the Norwegians and their British allies had been driven out of most parts of the country and had been compelled to retreat to the far north. They were now attempting to organize a defense in the region around Narvik. The distances involved in reaching this battlefield were a problem. The Womanos, fighting in the Norwegian theater, were rebased further north to Trondheim in order to be as close as possible to the targets in the far north. But even from here, they required more range than they had to reach the target area, which was something like 400 miles or 640 kilometers away. The immediate solution was the so-called Dachobach conversion, which was applied to some regular C-model 110s. This simple expedient provided the needed fuel capacity by simply adding a very large, like 1,000 to 1,200 liter tank to the underside of the fuselage, directly below the crew compartment. This enormous tank was covered over with a wooden shell to somewhat streamline the shape. Even so, the resulting bulge greatly degraded the fighter's aerodynamics, and the extra weight of the tank and fuel made the plane clumsier. Even more so, as the tank emptied somewhat and the remaining fuel sloshed around, shifting the fighter's center of gravity in unpredictable ways. The air store crews were all but unanimous in their grave dislike of this conversion, not only because of the reasons above, but also because the tank leaked gasoline fumes into the cockpit and fuselage, creating a terrible fire and explosion hazard. Despite all the drawbacks, the Dachobach 110s, officially called D1s or sometimes D0s, were put into use and were able to carry out their bomber escort missions in support of the German drive into the far north. Fighter opposition here was made up of two RAF squadrons, one flying gladiators and the other using hurricanes. These inflicted some losses on the clumsy German planes, but the Allied position was crumbling, and they were unable to make much impact in the far northern air war before the British began to pull their units out of Norway altogether. These two brave British squadrons were also evacuated. As the hurricanes were too short range to simply fly back to Britain, they were embarked on the carrier Glorious, the shame ship that had brought them to Norway less than a month before. Despite having flown off of the carrier's decks before, they were not navalized sea hurricanes and they lacked carrier gear and arrestor hooks. Nevertheless, the pilots of both squadrons made successful landings on the Glorious, and all the fighters made it safely aboard. Unfortunately for them, the carrier itself encountered the German capital ship Scharnhorst and Neisenau while in transit. Escorted by only two destroyers, the carriers had no scout planes in the air which could have warned them of the presence of the German warships. As a result, the three British ships ran right into the Germans, and despite a spirited defense by the destroyers, they and the Glorious were sunk by the 11-inch gunfire of the warships, taking the evacuated squadrons to the bottom with them. As the battle progressed, the heavy fighters found themselves performing more and more missions out over the ocean, where they were tasked with protecting German coastal traffic and shore targets from the attentions of long-range British aircraft and carrier planes. This was a niche for which the Woman O's were to prove highly suitable, as their long range allowed them to patrol far out to sea. In addition, the second crewman was extremely useful in a navigations and communications capacity, as well as being able to operate the early marks of electronic gear, such as radar, and prove useful in these and other missions. The aircraft the 110s were likely to encounter out on these missions were large, multi-engine reconnaissance and bomber aircraft, which they were well able to combat, rather than high-performance fighters. The use of the air shores in this kind of maritime patrol mission over the North and Arctic seas would continue long after the end of the fighting in Norway, and the pilots of the first group of ZG-76 would remain based at Savanger to operate in this capacity. Their deadliness in this role is illustrated by a pair of actions on July 9th. In the morning, 110s along with 109s of the fighter wing JG-77, intercepted an attacking force of 12 Bristol Blenheim bombers and brought down seven of them. Later that afternoon, the Austrians air store A. Gordon Golub encountered a four-engine Sunderland flying boat while on patrol over the North Sea. He was able to bring it down in a battle that saw him chase the big British plane halfway back to Scotland. Later that day, he would add a patrolling Coastal Command Hudson to his score, one of many such aircraft that would fall victim to the Zerg stores flying out of Stavanger in the weeks and months to come. As the campaign wound down and the British began to evacuate their troops, the Zerstores of ZG-76 flying from Trondheim would tangle with the fleet air arm once more. On the 13th of June, the British mounted a raid intended to strike the German capital ship Scharnhorst, which lay in the harbor of Trondheim. The plan was for a force of RAF Beaufort bombers to strike first, then retreat fast and lead the German fighter defense on a chase out to sea, while a force of fleet air arm scuba dive bombers went in with 500-pound bombs to hit the ship. The RAF bombers went in, but were too fast for their distraction to work. The defending fighters, which were 110s from ZG-76 and 109s from JG-77, scrambled and set off in pursuit of the raiders but gave up on catching them. Turning back towards Trondheim, they encountered the formation of scuba dive bombers on its way in. The lumbering British planes were massacred by the Germans, with 8 out of the force of 12 being dispatched in quick succession. Four of the scuas were credited to the 110s of the first group of ZG-76. 
This disaster was directly responsible for the withdrawal of the SCUBA from frontline service with the fleet air arm, and the consequent abandonment of the dive bombing attack as a whole by British naval aviation, air afterwards would fly only fighter and torpedo bomber types from their carriers. This would only change in mid-1943 when a newer generation of naval aircraft, beginning with the Ferry Barracuda, began to enter service. Along with the decision of Maria Bombing Command to abandon daylight bombing of Germany as a result of the defeat of the Wellingtons at the Battle of Heligoland Bight, this was the second major change in British strategic air power doctrine in a little over six months that had been forced on them by a slaughter of their forces at the hands of the 110 crews of a single unit, the first group was EG-76. The Scandinavian campaign was certainly a success in the career of the Zerstor arm. Though the numbers involved were somewhat less than had been involved in the campaign in Poland or in those to come, the men and machines of the 110 squadron stretched the capacities of the heavy fighter to the limit, and especially in the case of the desperate air landing ops at the outset of the attack, into completely unanticipated directions. It is very likely that no one had expected to fly their aircraft to a hostile country, land it on a hostile airfield, and then proceed to employ it as a mobile machine gun nest in a firefight on the ground. Throughout the operations in the north, the men of ZG-76 consistently excelled in the new task demanded of them. But a larger test was coming to the rest of the squadrons of the Zerstor arm, who remained stationed further south, along the German western border opposite the French and their allies. The long-anticipated attack in the west came on May 10, 1940, before the fighting in Norway had come to an end. The Scandinavian campaign was very small in scale compared to the battle that now broke out over France and the Low Countries. By now, the German heavy fighter arm was fully equipped with up-to-date PF Holman OCs and Ds. Aside from the single group of ZG-76 that was to remain at Stavanger, flying missions over the cold northern seas, the entire force was arrayed against the Belgian, Dutch, British, and French forces massing across the frontier. This was a much larger force of 110s than had been committed in the previous battles. Nine full groups of 110s, belonging to five heavy fighter wings, which were ZG-1, 2, 26, 76, and 52, as well as the group flying with the Lehrgeschwader, were all on strength. This is roughly 27 squadrons, or between 275 and 320 aircraft. In the weeks before Hitler made his move, the returning spring brought better weather. As a result, clashes between the fighters of the two sides became more frequent. The most often encountered fighters flying for the French were the domestically built Moran Saulnier MS-406 and the American Curtis Hawk 75. Curtis was the same type of fighter ordered, but not ready for the Norwegians. In U.S. service, the plane was known as the P-36. A reliable, if mediocre, fighter, the P-36 was one of the early generations of monoplane fighters built in the United States during the mid-1930s, and was a direct predecessor of the more famous P-40. As the Hawk 75, the radial engine fighter had been widely exported and served in a number of air services in Europe and around the world. The French procured large numbers of the plane, and they were encountered throughout France and her colonial empire. A total of 316 would eventually be delivered to France. It was a rugged machine with decent performance, and shared with the later P-40 the strengths of excellent high-speed handling and a fast roll rate, again especially at high speed. The very lightly loaded wings of the Hawk gave it a small turning circle and excellent performance in a steep turn, as well as a very fast rate of climb, though its performance at higher altitudes was somewhat handicapped by the use of a one-speed supercharger. However, like most of the early metal monoplanes, it was underpowered, with consequent effects on top speed and acceleration, and it lacked the fast dive of the P-40. Nevertheless, the skilled pilot that controls the Hawk 75 could definitely prove a dangerous antagonist to a 110. The French pre-war air rearmament program, which had begun in 1933, had been hamstrung by the atrophy suffered by its domestic aviation industry, previously one of the world's leaders, during the Depression years. So bad was the situation that the major contractors were unable to deliver new, modern planes ordered as part of this program. The French government, Reflecting the volatile and radical politics which characterized the French Republican government in the 1930s, responded to this failure of French industry by nationalizing the aircraft manufacturers in 1936 and reorganizing them into centrally managed conglomerates based on geographical region. It is for this reason that the major French aircraft manufacturers such as Amio and Bloch disappear in the immediate pre-war years, replaced by new entities bearing unfamiliar acronyms like SNCAN or SNCASE. The effects of this change were less than had been hoped, and the production of new planes continued to lag behind expected goals right up until the outbreak of hostilities, reaching parity with German production only in the month of the attack. Part of this was due to the manner in which the nationalization was affected. To cite just one aspect of this, only the production of aircraft themselves was nationalized. The aircraft engine industry, on which aircraft manufacturing clearly depends, was not included in the reforms. 
largely negating the possibility of the hoped for centralization and coordination of aircraft production in the national interest. It is for this reason that the Curtis Hawk 75 fighters, among others, were being purchased abroad in the pre-war years. This is not to say that the French did not field good domestic-built fighters. The above mentioned Morand Saulnier MS-406 was the most widely encountered in the new generation of French fighters, reaching squadron service in the first part of 1939. Morand was a good fighter, very nimble, with its maximum speed of 285 miles per hour or 460 kph, was dangerously slow against the German 109s and 110s. Further, the armament of two light machine guns and a 20mm automatic cannon was prone to jamming and malfunction. The plane carried very limited ammunition for the cannon, so in a long fight it would often have to go up against the enemy with just the two light machine guns. The aircraft was capable, but not a real match for the German machines. The better fighter, the Debotin D520, had only begun to enter service in the months immediately preceding the war. It was still slower than the 109, but could outpace the 110s it would face in the French skies. Only a small number of Debutines had entered service before the invasion, and those which did saw the greater part of their air combat, perhaps unexpectedly, in the south against the Italians. In numerical terms, the French had a little more than 800 serviceable fighters on strength when the invasion went in. The Air Force as a whole suffered from poor communications and coordination, as well as considerable doctrinal confusion and neglect. These inherent weaknesses became very serious under the pressure of the German onslaught, the French opposition in the air would consistently operate in a very brave and tenacious, but tragically uncoordinated and poorly directed manner. Even though they fielded a large force of comparatively modern aircraft, Armée de l'Air would be unable to do much to hold back the German onslaught. The Dutch had defunded their air force into dormancy during the interwar years. They began their rearmament program as Hitler's aggressive attentions became more and more clear. This resulted in their acquiring a fairly modern, although small, fighter force of 36 Fokker D-21 fighters like those used by the Norwegians, with a further small number of older D-17 biplanes. They also fielded 35 twin-engine Fokker G-1 fighters. These latter are interesting in that these planes, which were nicknamed the Reaper or the Mower, were another aircraft built like the 110 to a heavy fighter specification. The G-1 was a very modern two-seater design, was very nimble, and carrying a heavy nose armament very much like that of the 110. It was a little slower than the 110, but otherwise a very close match, and these Dutch their stores would have almost exactly balanced the same number of their German counterparts. The small Belgian Air Force flew small numbers of Hurricanes, Gladiators, and Italian CR-42 biplane fighters in their fighter units, as well as some Ferry Fox and Battle Light Bombers. Like the Norwegians, the Belgians had ordered some aircraft from foreign sources, but these were not delivered by the time of the attack and the planes were delivered to France and Britain instead. The British had a small RAF contingent in French territory, flying hurricane fighters like those used by their counterparts in Norway. In addition, the British had several squadrons of bombers in France, using such modern but mediocre types as the single-engine Battle and twin-engine Blenheim. Critically, for the experience of the German heavy fighters opposing them, the RAF had made the decision to not send units equipped with the Spitfire to France. As a result, the Germans would not encounter this advanced British fighter, which was the best in Allied hands at the time, until the end of the British Expeditionary Force in France, during the evacuation under fire at Dunkirk. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the actual fighting in France, not because I think it's uninteresting, but because little new tactical ground was broken in the course of the fighting in this campaign. In broad terms, the Zerstores played the same role here as they had in Poland and Scandinavia. The majority of the squadrons were deployed along the southern and central sectors of the frontier facing France and Belgium, and these opened the campaigns flying escort missions for the medium bombers and Stukas in the by now usual manner. Again, the primary targets were airfields, and more than 50 of these were hit in France alone on the first day. These raids by and large achieved tactical surprise, and little resistance was encountered in the air. Many aircraft were destroyed on the ground, and the initial objective of disrupting the enemy's air force and disorganizing their air defense was partially achieved in the first days. In the northern sector, facing the Netherlands, were the squadrons of ZG-1. Unusually, these were tasked with ground attack missions on the first day, and shot up Dutch airfields, wrecking many aircraft on the ground and destroying a few Dutch fighters in the air. Total 110 losses on the first day were only two planes. A higher toll would be exacted the next day when the Zerstores had their first clash in the air with RAF Hurricane squadrons flying from French fields. These British fighters were able to destroy two of the ZG-2's 110s despite the formation of a defensive circle by the Zerstores. This was a worrying portent of what might be expected to occur should the 110s be forced to face fighters with a markedly better performance than their own. The Hurricanes and Morans the Germans would tangle with over France were just at about at the limit of what the 110 could handle on its own. The 
Twin Engine Machine was far from helpless against these fighters, however. In one of the hardest fought actions of the air campaign, Six Squadron from ZG-76, flying their distinctive Sharkmouth 110s, went up against the Hurricanes of No. 1 Squadron RAF near the city of Leon. In this fight, some of each Air Force's best pilots were present, and the results were fairly even, with three Hurricanes shot down for the loss of two Zair Storers. This combat occurred on May 15th, which was the worst day for 110 losses in the course of the campaign, with nine destroyed and fighting all along the front. Three days later, on the 18th, eight more would be lost. An example of what happened when the Germans met French fighters can be seen in the action that took place on May 17th. On this day, eight 110s of 4 Squadron ZG-76 were flying escort for a formation of HE-111 medium bombers attacking a railroad target near the town of Albert. The enemy, a force of about 30 Marans and Curtis fighters, appeared as they were headed back after the strike. French planes ignored the fleeing Heinkels and came after the 110s. As French closed to engage, they performed a dazzling array of aerobatic maneuvers, apparently to make the German targeting difficult. If this was their purpose, the gambit was ineffective. The ensuing melee saw the Germans down six Frenchmen without taking a loss of their own. As fighting near the Channel coast, the Germans began to encounter formations of Spitfires, flying across the Channel from bases in the home islands to defend the evacuation beaches and the multitude of shipping taking the British Expeditionary Force off from them. In the last week of May, fierce air battles were fought over the coast and its surroundings. Though the 110 was definitely outclassed by the Spitfire, the results of the clashes between the two were not always in the British fighters' favor. On the 31st, for example, a swarm, or a four-ship formation, from the 5th Squadron of ZG-26 attacked a ragged formation of Spitfires and claimed five victories. The next day, fighters from the 2nd Group of ZG-76 claimed seven RAF fighters destroyed, including at least one Spitfire which was seen to augur directly into the evacuation beach. In all, the Germans would lose 60 110s during the decisive phase of the Western Campaign, ending with a British evacuation on the 3rd of June. The remainder of the campaign lasted three weeks and resembled the latter part of the Polish Campaign. Opposition in the air was sporadic, so the majority of Zerstor Squadron's activity consisted of ground attack missions on the increasingly disorganized French armies, now everywhere in retreat. Few losses were incurred against the French in these last few weeks of fighting, although some were inflicted by the neutral Swiss. Luftwaffe aircraft were often tempted to cut across portions of Swiss territory, and the Swiss Air Force, which was equipped with Mr. Schmidt BF-109s, had brought down a number of Luftwaffe machines, mainly HE-111 bombers. Furious at this, the Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring ordered reprisals. The first of these two missions consisted of a single Heichel bomber sent into Swiss airspace with an escort of 28 BF-110s from ZG-1. Swiss fighters intercepted, and each side lost a single aircraft in the ensuing battle. Four days later, three squadrons from ZG-1 were sent over the border, where, after shooting down a lone Swiss reconnaissance plane, they formed defensive circles over the mountains and awaited the Swiss response. This consisted of another interception by 109s. In the dogfight which followed, another Swiss fighter was brought down, but this time for the loss of four 110s. Presumably, Goering felt his point had been made, and no more incursions into Swiss airspace were mounted. My treatment here of Zer Storer's role in the Battle of Britain will also be relatively brief, but this is in many ways the pivotal action of its career. This is, again, not because the battle of the heavy fighters here is uninteresting, but rather because little new tactical or operational ground is covered in this battle. The defining difference of the battle is that for the first time, the Zer Storer arm was deployed against an opponent fielding first-class fighter opposition as part of a well-organized and undisrupted air defense system. Use of the heavy fighter against radar-directed, high-performance, single-engine fighter opposition very quickly revealed that the aircraft was unable to perform its bomber escort role in this more hostile air environment. In the initial weeks of the battle, the action centered not on England itself, but on the Luftwaffe efforts to deny the English Channel to the British. Although 110 units were not directly assigned to anti-ship operations as a part of this effort, they flew maritime missions in support. Even in this relatively benign environment, losses began to mount in a worrying fashion. Between the 9th and the 11th of July, nine 110s were lost over the Channel and the English coast. The anti-shipping portion of the battle reached a crescendo in the early days of August, as the Luftwaffe prepared to shift its focus to attacks on Britain proper. On the 8th of August, two groups of 110s from ZG-2 and LG-1 fought a long battle over a Channel convoy. Between them, they were credited with 18 kills. This strong performance was an isolated experience, however. Three days later, two groups from ZG-2 flew escort for one of the first big raids into the country itself. Here, things began to really fall apart. On this first big raid, six 110s out of 60 present were lost, including the formation's leader. Things got worse on what was supposed to be the climactic day of the assault, the 13th of August, 
during so-called Adler Tag, or Day of the Eagles. The 110s employed as escorts on this day suffered the largest single-day losses of the war so far. Thirteen were shot down. This figure would be greatly exceeded two days later, when another intensive series of raids on the 15th saw no fewer than 30 110s, or the equivalent of three full squadrons, lost in combat. Part of this day's action was the intervention in the Battle of Bombers North in Norway, and escorted by the 110s as UG-76 flying from Stavanger. These their shore units were still flying the clumsy, converted Dackelback 110s with the large and hazardous ventral fuel tank. They were sent to accompany a raid across the North Sea into northeastern England, which was supposed by the Germans to be lightly defended based on the assumption that RAF fighter strength was fully occupied in the south. It was not, and the raid met heavy opposition from squadrons of Spitfires and Hurricanes. The German force was decimated, with the escorting 110s suffering 7 losses out of 21 fighters. At least one of these losses is known to have been the result of an explosion of the much-hated belly tank. The German forces in Norway, terribly mauled, were withdrawn from the battle after this one raid. The mounting losses suggested that a similar withdrawal might be in order for the rest of the force, but a stubborn Goering refused to allow this. A similar problem had arisen with another Luftwaffe mainstay, the Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber. This aircraft had also been found to be essentially helpless when confronted with the RAF air defense. Stukas had been massacred in the first days of the cross-channel campaign, and had been taken out of the battle on the 18th of August. It is often thought that the 110s were withdrawn around the same time, but this is not the case. The 110s continued to battle it out against the odds all the way through the daylight portion of the battle. They appeared to have been taken out of battle due to the much reduced scale of their store operations. This is not due to any withdrawal order, however, but due to very heavy losses. Individual their store units would disappear from the battle order due to extreme depletion. The majority of these units would not be reconstituted and remained inactive, with their surviving men and machines transferred to either the expanding night fighter force or to fighter bomber units, where they were still able to play a useful part. Total losses in the battle are revealing of the extent of the disaster. At the start of the battle, Luftwaffe had 237 110s on strength. Losses amounted to almost this entire starting strength, with a total of no fewer than 223 shot down. Luftwaffe's heavy fighter arm would not recover from this harrowing experience. The disbanded their store formations would remain defunct until later in the war, when they would be reconstituted, but not as offensive strategic fighters. A much smaller force of surviving units would continue to fly in the original strategic fighter role for the next couple years, but the day of the their store was by and large over. From now on, the 110 could fly and expect to live only where it would not meet modern single-engine fighter opposition. And so that's where I think I will conclude this episode. I hope you found some of what I had to say here interesting and useful, and I hope that I've given you a good idea of the role the Zerstor played in the German conquest of Western Europe. The idea that Zerstor would fulfill its potential and then become outdated in the course of the campaigns of 1940. The career of the BF-110, however, is far from over. So thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you'll come back again for the next episode of the Record of Arms, where we'll turn south to take a look at the experience of some of the Zerstor units that survived the Battle of Britain and went on to fight in the Mediterranean Theater in 1941 and thereafter. Till then... This is Mark Seven, as always, wishing you all the best.